Hey dudes, what's happening? This is Trent, and today I got a special guest I wanted to bring on to talk with you guys because this guy, uh, his name is Jason Brubaker, and I've known him for a good number of years, and I've watched this guy go from kind of aspiring to do comic books as a kid to getting into Hollywood and working in film animation on films that you've probably seen and heard of, uh, to branching off to go back to his dream projects and be a completely self-made independent artist and writer. This is Jason Brubaker. Uh, welcome, Jason. How you doing? Thanks, Trent. Th thanks for having me. And, and you know, that intro is interesting because you're one of the few people that I actually did meet way before I got into anything. Uh, tracked you down and went to your house that's right you stalked me bothered you did you come to my house i didn't I came know you to your did. house <laughs> what yeah. did you do there did you talk to my mom <laughs> no i talked i talked to you you showed me some like ninja turtle pages that you were working on it was it was Whoa. like around some sort of comic convention time okay i met you at the show and then i said hey can i i i don't remember exactly how it happened maybe Whoa. i didn't meet you at the show but i met someone who knew you yeah i have you know, no memory of my before the internet I have no memory of my teenage years. So, <laughs> no, but there was, there were, I, I do remember a few instances of meeting people because I was doing Creed at the time. And yeah. um, most people don't know what Creed is now. They think it's a Stallone movie. Um, but when, when I'm talking about Creed, I had done that indie comic from my, from 1993 up until like 99. Yeah. And, and yeah. so you had heard of me through that. But yeah. you were doing your own comic called, was that Phobos at that time? Phobos. Yep. Yeah. 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 And that came out through Samson. Was it Samson? Yeah. Yeah. Samson. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that was like the connection. Yeah. The the publishers, the the little indie publishers, kind of connected us. I think back then we didn't have cool things like forums and uh, yeah. uh, Discord groups <laughs> and YouTube and things like that. So we had to manually go and like when you spoke to somebody, <laughs> it was either on the phone, you had to yeah. know their phone number, or you know to their face, you go to a convention or something. Interesting uh, how the world changes. But this is yeah. really fascinating because now uh, you're in you're in Idaho. Uh, talk to me a little bit about where things went from because uh, you went on a, you've gone on a crazy journey the last twenty five years or so. So you were doing indie comics in the mid nineties. That was like ninety four, ninety five, maybe somewhere around yeah. there, right? And yeah. how did you t take me from there? Where did things go? Because you went to you went to Hollywood, man. Yeah. Well, you know, I was trying to get into comics, so I started submitting. Uh, to publishers like Spider-Man submissions and Daredevil submissions. And um, you can actually see a lot of those on my YouTube channel. I've been cracking them back open again and checking them out. And uh, I started getting interest from people when I went to the San Diego Comic-Con. And uh, I started getting some little job offers. And um, then I went to a DC editor's line and he gave me his card. And a guy pulled me aside after that. And he represented storyboarding artists in L.A. And he said, um, "This the, the DC editor only gives his card to like one in ten people. And, and I pull him aside after. So uh, he showed me his, the portfolio and he says, we pay this much. And I was like, my eyes bulged open, you know. And uh, so I was like, okay, I can figure out what storyboards are. And if you think I can do it, then, then I'll try. So I went home and I, I made a plan to like two months from now, I'm going to drive to L.A., meet this agency. Um, I'm going to have some, some storyboards, you know, like basically just copy stuff off commercials and whatever, it, you know, pause the frames of a movie or a commercial and then draw it. Yeah. That was what he recommended to, to build a portfolio out of nothing. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I went to LA with a portfolio along with some other things, other job offers to, to meet with people and, um, just saw, saw this agency that just blew my mind. They had Disney on the phone and Warner brothers on another line. And there was a whole crew crowd of people just working this uh, agency and um, showed him my boards and he liked it and they, they basically hired me on the spot and I and they said can you move here now and so then <laughs> it was like okay I need to figure out how to move there uproot so, your life yeah you know so yeah. like it was another two months later and I was living in LA I stayed on the couch of some people who knew some people who were friends of some other people I knew <laughs> what year was that it was 96, like November no 96. Yeah. Wow. And how long did you, so, so there, this brings up a couple of questions for one. It sounds like it was so integral for you to, to meet face to face with some people at that comic convention, right. To meet that guy, to yeah. get the contact, 
to then exactly because they see that you're a person and and then they see so they've attached your your artwork to a person that's important and then they also they gave you enough contact and for it was a breadcrumb but you ran yeah. with it and seeing you run yeah. with it is really kind of what gave you an opportunity to come out did they fly you out did you say um <laughs> They flew me out for an interview with the Wachowski brothers for The Matrix, believe it or what? not. What? So that, they, they flew me out, and I, they put me up in a hotel, and they said, read the script. Tomorrow morning you have an interview. And I read it until 3 in the morning, and then I m- went and met with them the next morning. The agent picked me up and took me to Warner Brothers. and You got an I, advanced I, copy I, of the script for The Matrix before it was out. <laughs> <laughs> and it was awesome too. Back in cool. the, you know when I read it, I never yeah. read it before. No, I was still like, wow, this is going to be really good. So I didn't get the job because uh, I was way too young. Sure. I mean, not too young, but I just I looked like I didn't know what I was doing. Uh-huh. I had the artwork, but they were just like, I remember the producer was like, son, you know, slow down. We can't understand a word you're saying. Oh was like no way. Me on the shoulder. You were just too um, excited, right? Just too excited, and it was just I was too wet behind the ears. They they knew sure. I didn't have any experience. The yeah. agency told me, like, go in there, say, like, t- acting like you're tired of doing storyboards. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> right. I, how am I supposed to do that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're enthusiastic. That's a yeah. tricky, that is a tricky thing, but too, though, because it is kind of like, I mean, I, I, I kind of always feel like getting work in, in um, as a professional artist is almost kind of like dating. It's like, you don't want to look too eager, you know? Yeah. You know, you don't want to look like you're too excited about this, you know? It's like, eh, it's cool, it's another opportunity, you know? Uh, and that's a difficult thing. That just really comes from experience, I think. I don't know that you can, especially yeah. if you're a passionate, expressive person, I tend to like wear my heart on my sleeve. I, I, I think you're, you write a lot of personal things, so I think there's there's a bit of that in, in you as well. Yeah, it's hard to like hide yeah. that enthusiasm, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yep. So that it didn't work out with the Matrix. What did it work out with? Where did things go from there? Well, um, a couple of weeks later, I finally drove there and and uh, lived with some friends of friends of friends, and I ended up getting um, the first job I got was about a week later. Um, they booked a, a movie project or a movie interview for this little movie called Boogie Boy. And um, I had a job for a Doritos commercial as well. So um, I was in you know, um, Lakewood, and I had to drive all the way up to the valley. And I, this is a, a kid from Idaho who'd mm-hmm. never been used to traffic or reading street signs, mm-hmm. you know, because here you just go by landmarks, like turn out the McDonald's. But anyway, mm-hmm. um, I was like late to the interview, uh, but – you know, I got the job because they're like, if you can do this, then, you know, we'll be happy. Your work's good. And I met, like, Joan Jett at the same time because she was part of that movie. Um, Boogie Boy. And Boys. then Boogie Boy. Boogie it's Boy. A real, it's a real winner. <laughs> <laughs> Is it I haven't on seen it in a long time. Is it on Netflix? I don't know. I don't know if you can. I'm sure you can find it somewhere online. Hmm. Um, it's interesting. It, it's, it's, it was, uh, yeah, I don't remember much about it but um it was an action movie you know yeah and um it was kind of around the time quentin tarantino stuff was really popular so they were trying to do a, a, a real like quentin tarantino style movie but didn't quite pull it off with boogie um boy. with boogie boy that's interesting. Yeah. boogie boy the, the name just doesn't really fit the movie either no? <laughs> once you see the movie <laughs> does it have it a just, lot of boogers or no it's a boogie no boogie not boogie, is it sir, no like it's, it's like a serious or? movie Oh, okay. I, I don't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Boogie Boy does not sound like not this year's person. blockbuster, uh, yeah. even in ninety in the nineties. Yeah. So you were working in uh, storyboarding for live action film, but you ended right. up you ended up going into animation, which I think is a more suitable. Well, technically, with storyboards, like, do you find that there's a big difference between working for a live action storyboarding and a live action film versus storyboarding an animation film. Can you talk a little bit about that transition? And because you did end up at DreamWorks at one point. Yeah. Were there other stops on the way to that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I did a lot of work for about six years in, in storyboards. And I the first the guy who directed that book, uh, not Boogie Boy, but the uh, Doritos commercial, he we became best friends. And he started showing me how to use Photoshop and showing me how to do animation. And um, so, and we just hung out all the time and in between jobs. 
And um, eventually he said, hey, I, I want to get into script writing instead of commercial directing. I, I have a script. Can you, um, can you do like concept designs for it? And I was like, sure. And this is time I was really trying to get out of storyboards too. Mm -hmm. So he hired me for about six months to just come to his loft and just, I brought my computer and he just showed me more Photoshop tricks. And, and I just made like 70 big concept design paintings for his script um, that he was going to try to option. And, um, and then that became kind of a portfolio for VizDev and, right. and, uh, then at the same time, I was trying to work on animation, uh, this this cat in this robot suit animation, which turned into Remind, my graphic novel, and um, and he's the one who showed me how to, you know, use After Effects and all that stuff, and so I started my name started getting passed around the same studios that I went to storyboards to do storyboards a, as an animation guy, because they trusted my work work ethic, and and I knew these people. And so they're like, well, Jason's doing animations now, so uh, let's hire him, you know. So I, I started um, arranging teams of animators, hiring ex-Disney animators, and just learning to animate um, mm -hmm. at these small studios doing commercial animation. And it was all hand-drawn. And this, um, this wasn't during the Flash era, because there was a big movement in the late... 90s towards flash animation with the yeah. icebox.com and several it was, of these kind of websites. It was towards the end of that. And I, I had friends that were kept trying to convince me to use flash, but I didn't like the way it looked as much. Yeah. And so, Vector. And, Vector yeah, animation. everything, everything I tried doing with flash, I just didn't like it. So I, I wanted to do the hand drawn stuff, but it was yep. right when Disney was announcing we're not doing hand drawn anymore. Mm -hmm. And so everyone was like leaving it and I was trying to get into it. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of this perfect time because there was also the merging of like digital and traditional yeah. in a big way. Yeah. And no one knew how to do it. None of the Disney guys knew how to do it. They knew their station. Like I could in between or I could scan, but no one knew how to do all the pieces. Yeah. And so I came in just with eagerness and I just, you know, dove into this world and figured it out. And so these motion design studios were hiring me to put together whatever they needed get, buy the equipment hire the people they didn't know how to do it <laughs> yeah and so um i started just directing and art directing and uh and animating and learning how to animate and uh it just became my world for about three four years and that was kind of around the same time um uh that this thing happened with my friend who i was doing the viz dev for him uh -huh. and so then when um we, we ended up hiring james baxter on one of the commercials i art directed Mm -hmm. And he animated it. James Baxter's a legend in animation. Mm -hmm. um, and so a couple, like a year later, he uh, called me and said, hey, can you come and work on this project for me? And it was the intro to Kung Fu Panda. And so um, I came nice. in and I was one of the After Effects guys and background animators and worked with him. And then DreamWorks basically, I don't know what happened really. I was there, but I don't know what happened. But either DreamWorks bought him out or just gave him an offer he couldn't refuse or or – made him shut down the studio. I don't know. Uh, but we all kind of filtered into the back door of DreamWorks at that point. Oh, and, that's what and happened. Then, yeah. and, and then DreamWorks wanted me to be the, the After Effects guy. Like, I was I was in this position to be uh, in charge of kind of like After Effects, but I was like, I, I, I don't want to... That's not what I want to do. I want to draw. You know, I, yeah. I can use After Effects to, to make my drawings come alive, yeah. but I don't want to just be the After Effects guy. Right. And so I really pushed away from it and put in a portfolio to do VizDev and um, got into VizDev on Kung Fu Panda 2. Well, you can, get, you can get trapped. And you were mentioning that earlier. You were talking about the old animators at Disney that they were great at their station. They were great at that thing that they hired them to do. And that's, that's why they got the job, which is kind of a catch-22. And we'll get to why you may have left or why reasons why you had left the animation industry at that time. But I, I, I know that at least for my part and, and a lot of artists that I know, the big drawback to working at a big company and a big production is like, it can be very glamorous and it can be very exciting. But a lot of times you kind of get pigeonholed into just doing that one thing. And if you wanted to do, if you're a self-starter or you're used to running your own company or you like to have your own vision of, of or even have your hands on a lot of different things, it can be very restricting in a, in a big environment like that because as yeah. you said, like they wanted you to get on After Effects. If you had gone that route, you might very well still just be animating somebody else's artwork in After yeah. Effects. Yeah. 
and it's a great job you know I have, I have a lot of friends that still do it and they're moving right. up the ladder you know they're like they have the big credit now on the stability movies. security and, all those things too you know? in a big team yeah yeah, I yeah. Get, and if that, if you're cool with that it's like it's, it yeah. can be a very fulfilling career because hey those guys get to go home and shut it off yeah and they you get the paid vacations and paid sick days and yeah free lunch and we'll get <laughs> we'll get to some of that uh talk later but uh so Actually, yeah, let, that is a good point to transition to from from here. So we're talking about what it was like working in animation, uh, and then deciding you made a big and this is this is really kind of one of the the most impressive things that I found about you is that like you had you had it all. You had the dream job. Like when when I was a kid, oh my god, being an animator or you know yeah. directing sequences in in a major motion picture would have been like that's all I need. I'm just gonna s- yeah. stick it out there and do that. And I'm sure there were times when you felt that too. That like I can't ever leave this. This is the pinnacle, right? So what was it? It, at some point, something was rattled around in your mind that you're just like, this isn't where I, what I want to do with my life for the, yeah. when, in the grand scope of things. What was the, the, the thought process, the transition? And the, was there an impetus? Was there a specific moment where you were like, that's it? I've got to make the jump now. And how yeah. did you go about doing that? That's a yeah. lot of questions all at once, but lead yeah. me through it. <laughs> oh, oh, so the first part... Um Wait, what was the first part of the question? Um, the first part of the question was, uh, what was it that really, was there a, a pivotal moment where you had decided that animation and the dream of doing this job isn't what I really want to do with my life? Yeah, you know, once you, t- the thing is I, I've, I tasted the freedom and the joy of making your own stuff and being in charge of everything yeah. early on. And so, and, and even with, um, w- once I got out of storyboards and into this uh, kind of leading the animation and just doing all the parts, it, it was just, that that was the most fulfilling, like, job job I think I had was, was when students would, these little studios would hire me and just say, put this team together and do it, you know, make it happen. And I would be in there working with everybody else. And, and then you'd deliver, you would render out this finished thing that you and you, three of your friends worked on you know that was really rewarding and fun um same as same as like working on the comics you know that that you'd work on like you working on creed and stuff it was just it was just fun to make your own things and have people respond to it and so you get a taste of that and it's and then it's hard to go into like a studio where they're like you don't like this movie and eh, whatever work on that. You don't like doing this part and eh, it doesn't matter. Work on that. You know? <laughs> yeah. You can't put and it then, back in the box, man. Once you get a taste of being a creator. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, so I got into DreamWorks and I was like, this is brilliant because I can, I can finally like learn from the best in the industry. So I just really wanted to immerse myself into color theory and like learning like the stuff that I've never learned before because I just didn't have the people around me doing it, you know? Yeah. Um, but I kind of, I, I felt like even going in, like, I don't want to, st- I know I can't stay here and I, and I can never get comfortable with it. And you mentioned it in your email to me, like the golden handcuffs that was so like in the forefront of my mind. It's like DreamWorks is the biggest golden handcuffs I've ever had. You know, it's so tempting to just want to stay because the paycheck and the, all the things that come with it. And everyone knows those movies. I, yeah. I don't even have to explain my job to people anymore. They're just like, <laughs> Like, whoa, Kung Fu Panda, you know? Yeah. And it's really neat. And I worked on essential key scenes and stuff. But um, at the end of the day, it's like three years in, I was ha- I finished the contract. And I was kind of itching to go. But I had some, I had two kids, uh, you know? So, uh, and so I was like, at that stage, I was like, I need to stay here for the stability of, of having babies, you know, two babies. Yeah. And so, so I was kind of like, I'm fine with it right now. But as soon as the kids get old enough, like like maybe three three years old for the youngest, it's like I gotta, I don't know, I, I think I gotta get out of here. And um, so I had two contracts with them, and it ended up being about a seven year uh, run. Um, and I was in the middle of Kung Fu Panda three, and I just I like all the all the excitement of of working on a big movie was just <laughs> was just gone. And I had been publishing web comics on the side. And it was more enjoyable to like put a page up on Monday and you see the comments and go yeah. to conventions and sell books to people. And then I would come back from that and be like, 
okay, let's work on Kung Fu Panda again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> a weird thing to think about. Um, but it's just, it wasn't my thing. It yeah. wasn't mine, you know. I, I was just, um, I, was, I was doing someone else's vision. And, uh, and I really had to work to get in, into the mode of being excited to be in this world of, of uh, Kung Fu Panda or, or whatever movie I was working on. Yeah. You know? Well, it takes a certain level of, um, <laughs> I'll say almost like, uh, uh, I don't know what the, the proper word here is but that I'm reaching for, but almost like a delusion of, almost, it feels like you're going crazy when you start to think, yeah, no, my ideas are, are better than, than working on that big, huge thing, right? I know people are going to love what I make more than that big thing that like, because I, I know this because I was working at Blizzard and I started to feel the same way where it's like, I couldn't make anything cooler than what, I, you know, what I'm making with this huge team. And that in a sense is kind of true. Like what I made on my own is not. And I'm responsible for every, you know, yeah. misspelling or flaw in the printing or any problem <laughs> that goes wrong. I'm fully responsible for that. I can't pin that on anybody else's job that was I'm supposed to be good at all these things and it takes a certain level of crazy I guess is what I'm trying to say to yeah. think that you can do it on your own but you actually took steps to do that and yeah. would you say that there was a definitive moment where that happened or would you say that it was just like it had been brewing until you were just like I figured out a plan and then I took that action yeah, it. I can say there was a definitive moment, but it's not because of anything, any circumstances that happened. Um, I was, you know, things were going great at the job, and I think it was more like life. Like I was, I had two kids. I was in LA. Mm -hmm. My, um, uh, it was just stressful to to pay the mortgage, and um, I I started feeling trapped in LA. I guess is how you could say it mm -hmm. um because i the first 10 years i i felt like oh this is my home but then after that it started feeling like how do i get out of here and but i didn't feel and i never felt like i could leave because i felt like i was chained to hollywood and so once um i started putting stuff online and people started responding and i started making a hundred thousand dollar kickstarter campaigns it just it really made me realize i i can i can go anywhere i want now i don't if I can make this work, I can go anywhere I want. Um, so with those kind of thoughts building up in the background, there was a defining moment when I was I, can't, I was driving home from work one day and I was just kind of like, I was like, you know, uh, frustrated and just like yelling at God and being like, well, what do you, you know, I don't want to, like, what am I supposed to do here? <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, uh -huh. and, um, and it, it just, in a moment, it was really strange. It, everything clicked. I was like, I could move to Idaho and I could you know do this and if i yeah. sold my house here it would i could buy a house there and right. the cost of living is really cheap and yeah. i could i could get freelance online there's no reason why i can't do that and yeah. um and, and i could get like maybe you do it one or two days a week and it would pay for like a lot of stuff there versus in la <laughs> and so just all yeah. these like things and so i came home and, I, and my wife grew up in la okay so i was like she's not gonna have this and so i but I couldn't look at her. It was weird. It was like two days. I, I just couldn't even look at her. I wanted to like mull over this for a week, but I couldn't. And so finally I was like, honey, I got to talk to you. I have this idea. I think, I think this is what I need to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I broke down all the pros and cons. And she's like, I understand. I, I get it. It all makes sense. Yeah. But I need some time. But I get it. And I think I'm with you. But we need to make a plan. Let's make like right. a plan. Like give us a year. And let's, if all these things can fall into place in a year, then we can do it. And sure enough, every every step of the way, things would fall into place really well, and to to the point to where it made me go, I got, this is these are all signs. I just got to move, you know, like everything's falling into place, like getting freelance jobs and breaking the contract and still getting the bonuses and all these different different things. Um, I guess I didn't break a contract, but I I ended a contract right in the middle of Kung Fu Panda Three, and they wanted me to continue and mm -hmm. sign a contract. Anyway, so. So we moved and sold the house that sold for way more than we wanted, and we were able to buy a house here. And, uh, you know, it was just like a year later, we were on the road, and and uh, it's been like three and a half years now that we've been here in Idaho. Yeah. And have this little tiny studio, and the cost of living is just like nothing, you know? Yeah, that's the interesting thing, is that I found the hardest part is, is breaking out of the bubble of the psychology of, of what everybody around you wants. 
Yeah. And what they what you kind of get convinced that you should want to. But if you can identify like, no, 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 no. Like you, you kind of decided, and I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like you kind of decided this is more of what I want out of my life than what I, this sort of group of people around me all want for me yep. or for themselves. And so you took responsible action to make that happen. And there's a lot to unpack there, <laughs> like uh, just in terms of how you formulated your plan. You talked in our previous conversation a few years back, I was on your podcast that you hosted. Yeah. What was it called? Making the, Comics. Right. Yeah. And I was on your your podcast and we talked about uh, how uh, you only need the 1,000 fans. This was a theory that somebody, you were mm, reading a book yeah. by, who was the author that put that forth? It was like Kevin Kelly wrote an article about this online. Right. Yeah. And so you formulated a strategy to kind of go, okay, if, I, if what I want is more important than what the group around me wants, because I know this, when you're working at a big game studio, for instance, or a film studio, I'm sure it's like this too, you got the guys around you are all talking about getting the bigger house down the road or yeah. the new motorcycle or the boat or the vacation, the expensive vacations. And those things are fine and dandy for those people. That's that's something that they they could want for themselves. And I would never say that's not a good thing to want. Um, yeah. But if if you're one of those people who decides like, hey, no, 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 I really want to have my voice heard. And for you and I, I think we come from that comic book background. I grew up yeah. watching Todd McFarlane and Jim Lee yep. and Rob Liefeld <laughs> branch off and say F you to the corporations. Exactly, like yeah. we've got to do our, we're valuable, damn it. And we're going to yeah. figure out how to do your job too. And, yeah. and those guys were such inspirations for me. I was speaking with my friend Christian Leitner about this recently, who also did indie comics for a while. And, uh, and it was the same kind of a thing. It's like our inspirations come from, these independent self-made artists and creatives who recognize yep. their value. And they, they decided I'll just learn some of the business stuff to figure this out. And because of that, they were able to have all their independence and freedom. Yeah. But it's a bold move because you're going to upset some people who want to keep you chained to that desk, chained to mm -hmm. the chain down. And that's not a bad thing. It's business, you know, like, of course you have like a, yeah. a, a winning artist. You don't want to lose them, but yeah, if you're that winning artist, you got to recognize your value and go, I got, I got to formulate a plan. Have you, have you put together, I noticed you've written some books on Amazon and uh, one is called Unnatural Talent. Is that correct? Yeah. And mm -hmm. you've done some other eBooks and PDFs on how to formulate a, a Kickstarter. I did a little bit of research on you before our conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and uh, yeah. so do you talk much about your, like, what is the best resource for people to read a little bit more in detail about your strategies and your plans for how you went about sort of establishing, you know, you do a, you run a, a comic book publisher called Coffee Table Comics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, could you talk a little bit about or could you maybe point people in the direction of where they can read a little bit more about your journey of how you became independent and self-sufficient while still raising a family and branching off from the sort of the golden handcuffs of, of yeah, a, of a yeah. big company? Well, a lot of it's really contained in that book, Unnatural Talent. And the, the reason for that name is, is because I, I just don't believe talent is natural. I think you have natural interests mm -hmm. but but talent grows when you just work like crazy more than anyone else at something mm -hmm. and so you know you're obsessed with it and so you you keep working at it and you love it so you keep working at it and then you get that talent and so it's a it's it's an unnatural thing you know yeah. um and so that book really kind of goes what it did is it, is it kind of grabbed all the blog articles that i was writing over the years as i was trying to self-publish my first book and while I was working, you know, at DreamWorks and some a little bit before that, and um, I just kind of collected all that into this book, and so that has most of my like thoughts in that moment. Um, and uh, it's a little outdated now because it's 2013, so some of the strategies aren't really the same. But I, I think mm -hmm. the mentality is still like, spot on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, I also you know put stuff on my YouTube channel, but. I, I, I'm try. I always try to like veer away from being like the the how to guru. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I haven't tried to like make many more of those books, um, because my goal is really just to to make the the graphic novels. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I I treat YouTube like a um, 
not a how a how to place, but more like a, a documentation of of my journey. Yeah. And so people can learn by you know by just watching other people. You know. Yeah. And um, so I have all these live streams and all that stuff, and mm -hmm. I always answer questions on there and stuff. So that's the most up to date thing is the YouTube channel. Yeah. And I'm trying to keep that going, but. As and I'll put a link. I'll put a link in the description below. By the way, I want to make sure that people can find that because you're, oh, yeah, you just yeah. you started it uh, what a couple of years ago or when did you when did you get started with it? It was while I was well. So while I was making Remind, my first graphic novel, I was blogging. So it was on the mm -hmm. site called RemindBlog.com. Yeah. And um, that's when I was doing the Making Comics podcasts mm -hmm. and um, just really trying to learn everything. And uh, so so I started uh, during that time to kind of accompany. Um, certain blog posts like for instance I, I had one on different colors like what was the difference between RGB and CMYK and Photoshop mm -hmm. and so I was like the easiest way I could do this is actually make a video so I started a YouTube channel and just had the side by side comparison as I did things and I thought wow this is great it really helps the blog post really look nice mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so that was the extent of it back then yeah. but then um, um, it was after my second campaign uh, of Remind that made 107000 on Kickstarter, that's when I started thinking, well, maybe I should do YouTube instead of blogging. And I started kind of winding down the blog. And um, and then once I started to sit through my newest series, which is all complete now, it was, it was on Webtoons. Um, for, or I was a featured artist on Webtoons when I first moved out here for about two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And... Um, once once I started working on Sithra, I, I kind of discontinued the blogging. I didn't really know where to put my foot as far as, like, uh, putting my thoughts online. Because, you know, the website had – Webtoons had the comic and remind blogs where I was typing, but I don't want to keep filling that up with content. So I just – I started thinking, okay, well, let's keep going with YouTube. And it started growing, you know. It was kind of interesting, but I wasn't really sure how to approach it. And then um, once Sithra wrapped up, that's when I was like, I guess it was the last co last year of Sithra. I was like, okay, YouTube is going to be the new place for me. I, mm -hmm. I just I think people like the video more than digging through the blogosphere anymore. Well, that's, um, there is an interesting movement that's happened in the last five years, I'd say, that I just sort of stumbled upon. Like I, I got into YouTube because I realized that I don't uh, – when I, when I write uh, – blogs or something like that it's not as engaging or interesting to people but for some reason I, I i was getting a more positive response to my voice and seeing time lapse of the artwork people yeah. like see it as almost magical whether you're an artist or not it's neat i love to watch time lapse artwork so i was like i could do yeah. that and i had been doing time lapses since before camtasia even existed and and a lot of these screen capture things where i would just do uh, GIFs uh, or GIFs, I don't know how you yeah. can say that, uh, <laughs> where I would take the layers and switch them off to, and then export a GIF. So back in, in mm. 2003 with Photoshop, I was making GIFs of time lapses of my artwork, just turning on and turning off layers. And then putting that up on YouTube and getting a response from it was like, oh my God, I got to be, I got to be doing more of this. And that was right around the time PewDiePie was huh. blowing up for making, playing games online. I was like, visual yeah. medium, this is going to replace television. Um, yeah. And and not only that, but people are very interested in the behind the scenes of an artist's lifestyle. This is so weird. Yeah. It's so weird that you and it's, I it is weird yeah. get to create something. We'll literally wake up. I don't know about you, but like I'll wake up and I'll write down an idea for of a dream I had or something. Where it's it, just an idea that I had. I can make something and then and then sell that, and, or even just show it to people, and they'll they'll go, oh, that's awesome. I want more of that. You know. So it's mm -hmm. so crazy that you can almost like make money out of nothing. And make and not just money, but like the, just because it's something that you can sustain your living with. Do you know what I mean? Support yeah. your family on, but yeah. to to be able to support your family on something that you love is such a, a blessing, such an incredible yeah. gift in this in this life. I, I mean, I can't express enough how grateful I am every day just to be able to do that and then to yeah. share that that as you were talking about, just the journey of it on YouTube, yeah. I think is extremely valuable. And I've watched yeah. a few of your videos. I learned something. I mean, it's awesome when you do the tutorial type of content. Uh, you know, I, I learned something about your journey. There's so much of the details of, we couldn't possibly summarize your whole story 
in <laughs> in yeah. one video, one interview. So I want to encourage people to go over to your YouTube channel and check out you know some of your tutorials and some of the the behind the scenes stuff for building Sithra. Whether you're into storyboards or comics. Uh, it sounds like I'm winding this conversation down, but there's actually a bunch of questions I wanted to ask yeah. you. Uh, if you. If you got a little bit of time. I do. Um, so tell me a little bit about uh, uh, Remind and Sithra and what's what's next. Are you, are you planning a new book or because you've done Phobos, Remind, Sithra. Yeah. You said you just yeah. wrapped up Sithra. Like what, what is your current project? What are you most excited about? Let's start there. And if, okay. if you want to kind of talk about how they're different from your past projects, that would be good. Yeah. Well, um, so you want me to start on my current project? Yeah. Okay. So this year has been an interesting year for me. I actually uh, have been hired to to make a graphic novel this year, and it's and I'm and I'm writing it and drawing it and coloring it. It's just based on a concept, and um, a company out of the blue was like hey you would be the perfect fit this fits your style and um and so it's it's been a really different experience for me because i'm this whole month i've been writing and i'm writing scripts and i'm like all my life i was like i'm never going to be a writer you know mm -hmm. i'm not a writer I, I don't know how i can't spell anything right you know <laughs> like why would anyone hire me to write but i'm getting paid more than i've been paid in a long time to to just be writing right now it's really bizarre mm -hmm. um and it's this this graphic novel this that's going to start coming out later this year called Shapes, and um, it's um, I'm going to try to it's hopefully all be on the shelves and by the time December rolls around, it'll be a six part issue uh, series I guess, and um, so that's what I'm currently working on. Are you doing the artwork as well? I'm doing everything. Yeah, oh, I'm, wow, so okay. I'm, I'm writing it and drawing it and coloring it. Mm -hmm. uh, they just want me to do it the way I've been doing my books. So mm -hmm. it, it's like really to me, it's a, a test, another testimony to the power of personal projects. Like I really believe if you just do personal projects that you're in love with, people will want to hire you to start doing that for them. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyway, so that's the current thing. So I've kind of put some of my things on hold, like Phobos. I was, I've been working on it a lot and I, the relaunch of Phobos and um, I really love how, how it looks. I can kind of show you fans. So this is a little manga-sized version of it. And it's just all, oh, cool. um, yeah, you know, like old school, old horror show type stuff. But it's comedy. Uh -huh. So anyway, Phobos is the childhood thing, like your creed. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I just keep coming back to it because I just love it. I love the characters. I don't know if it'll go anywhere but it's one of those things i can't put down i can't stop thinking about you know yeah um now if you go to remind remind was start it started out as this animation that i that i just taught myself to animate with and uh when i realized i wanted to do comics or i was convinced to do comics i decided well i'll use this animation as the the base for my comic and because I already have it designed and stuff. And so that became Remind, which is this graphic novel mm -hmm. that you can get in two parts. And Remind was really me trying to prove to myself and everyone else that I could draw comics still. Mm -hmm. Because up until that point, I had I'd been doing storyboards. So it was all loose, sketchy, like nothing was ever finished. There was no color. Mm -hmm. And so it was really my attempt to just say, I can do these comics the way that I used to do them when I was submitting work. Mm -hmm. And... And kind of also that I can I can write a story. Like I mean, I can tell a story. I don't know if I can write a story, but I can tell one. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've been trained with all these working with all these directors doing storyboards, so mm -hmm. I know I can tell a story. Um, and so um, and it was great putting it online because I had a just a huge amount of editors like helping me with everything I spelled wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so before I would publish it, you know, it already gone through like a thousand people editing it. Uh -huh. <laughs> And giving me notes. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, so that was Remind. Remind was really a surprising like uh, experience. Like seeing how many people actually responded to it was surprising because it was the first time I tried it. And it was almost like this effort to just – like this last, last ditch effort to, to just see what – what happens with this thing I've been working on on my free time. Because I, I got the job at DreamWorks and I was like, okay, well, I have like a chapter of Remind – what do I do with it? You know, I've, I have the dream job. 
And I was like, well, I guess I'll put it online and it, for free. If anyone cares, then th- then that's cool, you know. And sure enough, a lot of people cared, a and lot people, people cared. Really yeah. passionate about. It. And yeah. so, um, so that really kind of started my brain thinking about like this could be a business now. This doesn't have to be a just a personal project. It could this could actually be the business, mm-hmm. and I just need to figure out how to scale it up. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so once Remind was done, I, I took a year off, really a, a kind of a hiatus from just my own projects. And I think I really needed it. I needed the vacation from that. And um, so I just focused on work and family. You know, I had two young kids at the time too, and um, my wife was going through postpartum depression. So it was like it was a good time to just take take a break from every all the personal projects. Mm-hmm. But um, so then, then 2014 is when I started Sithra. And I was like, okay, I'm going to put it online, but I'm going to do it completely different. I'm going to do it in scrolling format. I'm going to have little GIF animations in there. And so I just put up the whole first – I would put out like one big chunk once a month. There was like no update schedule. I was just like, I'm not going to let this rule my life at all. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to work and do this as good as I can. It comes out when it comes out. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to have a business plan for it kind of. Mm-hmm. And – um but it it uh, after a year of that I I did a Kickstarter for it and it did well it did like fifty thousand dollars on Kickstarter, mm-hmm. printed the first hardcover book, um, and then that's when I moved decided to move to to Idaho and then Webtoons approached me and said we want to pay you to be a featured artist on Webtoons, so it kind of just like was like this super crazy intense schedule from that point on like jamming out like ten to twenty pages a, a week for Webtoons. What? And it was it was I, I didn't want to give up on the quality either. Yeah, so I was That's a manga like, schedule, man. That's it, it is. That's crazy. It was, it was the most stressful thing <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> to work on my own project all of a sudden. And um, you know, no no breaks. And I would take off um in between books, I would take off like three months to 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 sketch and complete the writing and, and um and so Webtoons wouldn't be paying me yet you know, during that. So I was like tapping into some Kickstarter money and it was just a really stressful, but very fast paced time working on Sithra. And in about two and a half years, I finished it and it was about a thousand pages long and, um, ended up being, ended up being six books long. And so you can kind of see like, I have one back here. This is like one of, this is book two. So it's, this is a 160 page hardcover, you know, full color. Yeah. You work with a team on this, though, didn't you? You you had a colorist or somebody helping you with color flats for a period of time. It, yeah, I I've ever since Remind Two, I've been hiring someone to help me with my flats. Mm-hmm. Um, but with Sithra, I was always trying to pull in people to help me, like so I could speed it up. Mm-hmm. And I had a couple assistants helping me. A lot of them just helped me with the conversion from the page format to the webtoons format. Mm-hmm. And then. Um, and then the last two books, I I found an assistant here in town, mm-hmm. who is just a great young motivated artist, and and he's able to kind of match anything I do as long as I give him good reference. And he helped me color about half of the last two books. Awesome. So that was that was wonderful. And he's been helping me with Phobos too, and um and and this new project I'm working on, he's going to probably help me color about half the pages, which is just it's just great to have someone like that. Yeah. What's his name? Adrian, and I can't pronounce his last name, uh, Amartifio, <laughs> I can't <laughs> pronounce, I've never tried to say it online. Yeah. Uh, when you find, when you find somebody to work with that you can count on to yeah. consistently deliver good quality, it's a treasure. Oh, I found, so cool. uh, mm-hmm. yeah, cause I, I, I do a lot of contract work and I work with various artists and you would not believe, I mean, you know, 80%. Of, of people who think they want to do art for a living when they actually get an assignment, don't want to actually do it. Uh, yep. they, they'd rather be hanging out uh, or playing yep. games or partying or, or there's, there's not that professionalism there. So when you find somebody that's reliable and consistently does good quality, it's like, dude, yeah. I, I, I want to, I want to do everything I can to keep this guy working and, and getting them yep. money um, yeah. so that they can keep doing this for a living because it would be a damn shame if they couldn't, you know, yeah, um, yeah. especially because it's so rare, you know? Yeah. And it's just finding that the, the like-minded people who are, yeah. the, who they really just love 
their work and their yeah. art and they want to do the best they can. They put in extra work on these details that you didn't ask them to do. Yeah. You know, it's like this is the same thing that you and I did with our careers and that's why we had careers. Yeah. You know, it's because yeah, you don't want to hire someone who's like, "Okay, I'll get this done as long as you yeah. pay me." Well, that's a, that's a big yeah. That's a big problem in concept art for video games because there's sort of like the rock star view of what being a concept artist is and 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 some of these guys they make a good living just doing a couple of paintings a month you know uh doing these rock star paintings and they're not really usable in 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 the game development but that influences a lot of people to think that oh i just kind of do a couple of designs and then check yeah. out for the rest of the month and and it's unfortunate because that's the wrong lesson to learn yeah. there i've got a few more questions for you uh and these are going to be hard-hitting questions okay you ready for the tough stuff um, I'm ready. <laughs> All right. <laughs> do you do you uh, do you have any regrets about your career? Oh, interesting. Um, you know, there's a lot of times when I was very frustrated, and a lot of times I hated my jobs, and was pulling my hair out and being like, I don't want to do art anymore because of this, this, and this, and this. Um, but you know, that was in the moment but looking back at at all these ups and downs and and doors that opened that were unexpected and I go this way instead of that way um, I, I'm really content that I went through the trouble times the the detours the the random jobs and projects you know and, and I, I'm really happy that I did all those things that I did because it really made me who I am today and I don't think I could do it successfully without that stuff, you know, without the garbage and without the bad jobs and the, and the you know, the, the times where I wanted to quit. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's why I changed my career a lot in art was because I, I was just fed up with things. And, um, but it really, it really helped define the path that I wanted to take, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think you can figure that stuff out until you – until you try it and realize you don't want to do it and realize what parts you don't want to do, what, what hats you don't want to wear. And you know, what, what made me want to be an artist, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I realized it wasn't, I didn't want to be an artist to, to draw pictures for people. Right. I, I, may, I, I grew up drawing pictures because I was telling little stupid stories, whether it's with a little stick figure or what I was telling little stories. And so, yeah. you know, if, if I can, yeah, yeah, doing all these weird careers and different projects really honed the skill so now I can focus on just telling the story that matters to me yeah. and I'm not worrying about learning to beautify it anymore. Right. I've I that's natural now because of all the 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 the, the time I've spent <laughs> you know grinding away at that. Um so I don't think that career-wise I don't I don't really feel like I have any regrets. I can definitely look back on hard times and frustrations, but mm-hmm. I don't regret it looking back on it. Because the challenge made you appreciate it, what you have now. It made me make the decisions that I, I'm, I'm very hard headed with my decision making. And it's because of being in situations where I was either taken advantage with my art or yeah. bad jobs or whatever, you know? Yeah. And, well, you um, also, you also learn to identify those scenarios. Exactly. And yeah. like I've, I've done contract work for long enough now that I know I'm not going to enjoy working with those particular guys because of the way they've interacted with me in the first conversation yeah. or, or <laughs> I'm going to love working with these guys because of that, that first conversation, you, you learn to see the signs and there's sort yeah. of, I think there's some comfort in that a lot. I think people starting out in their career, a lot of times they get um, a little gun shy because they're like, well, I don't want to make the wrong mistake. I don't want to go into the wrong career path or something like yeah. that. But I think that you kind of have to, there, there's some comfort in knowing that there are no real mistakes in that way, as long as you're taking action now, like you're looking at yeah. your, you're taking stock of where you are now and kind of going, is this really fulfilling for me? Is this what I got into it for? I think it takes yeah. a certain level of introspection to be able to identify that. Um, oh, but, yeah. mm-hmm. but there's not really like the, cause I agree with you. It's like, I would, I went through periods of time, you wouldn't believe it pressure and the stress of, of working on some of the projects that I've worked on where I, I just felt like I wanted, like I didn't want it anymore. And, yeah. and, um, and I don't regret that I, I finished them because I look back and I'm like, man, 
if I hadn't gone through that, I wouldn't really have the, the true depth of appreciation that, mm-hmm. I, that I have now for the, the freedoms that I have and to be able to choose the projects that I work on and yeah. to be able to make a living and support the people that I love, you know, to, in doing this, it makes that yeah. appreciation only greater because of the struggle. Yeah, you know? I think so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, with that, with that topic in mind, would you ever go back to directing animation again or, or putting an animation team together, even if it's for one of your own projects, say that somebody comes to you and says, we're, we want to make a Sithra animated feature. Like if money wasn't the issue, would you go into managing the whole team to make that happen? Or would you rather just say, let the work stand as it is. Let other people handle that. I'm moving on. I've always taken the stance that I just want to make the next book, the next project, and let other people deal with the this version two of it, which would be the movie. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, but I think as I go, you know, now that I've been doing this full time and I've produced lots of books and um, – you know, I, I'm debating like what to do next, what books to do next, and um, I, I'm, I think that I'll get to a point to where I would, I would like to try it again, um, because you know, the, if you do something for ten years, you know, you you want to try something new. Mm-hmm. So I, as long as I'm creating and pushing myself in a in a way that I haven't pushed myself before, um, and you know, directing. And making a movie would definitely be that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I feel like at this stage in my life, I have too many um, concepts and ideas and stories and things I want to, I want to get the the initial concept done and out there. Mm -hmm. And so that's the priority. And until I at least get all the things out now that I have on my plate, which, you know, probably take me another 10 years to do all the things that, (laughs) that I've, I've, you know, want to do, yeah. especially if I do them in like six volume yeah. things, which I don't think I'm going to do this anymore. I think I got the thousand page story out of my system and I, I think I'm content with, with trying to narrow it down to two or 300 pages now. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Short stories. Yes, exactly. Yeah, short story. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the project I'm working on now, they went 120 pages and it's just like oh. the, it's like, it's a whole new yeah. experience to try to condense something down that small now and it's it's a really good learning experience for me and i'm i'm starting to find things in that that i'm like you know maybe i should do this for one of my other stories and make Mm -hmm. a 120 page version of it instead of a 300 page version you know yeah i always think of the saga like when i when i created twilight monk i was thinking of what he's going to be like when he's an old man in 20 years yeah. You know, like in uh, yeah. just in, in the universe of Twilight Monk, like I've already got stories for when he's an old man. And it's like, yeah. I'll probably be 80 years old still trying to like write these stories about these characters. Yeah. And yet there's still so much more I want to do. I, yeah. I have another question for you. This one's almost personal advice because you tend to complete projects and then put them out there and you seem like. Like you're a true creator, like you've, you've finished things. And, and, and I, I think I go through, and maybe you do too, and this is where the, the question comes from, but I go through a lot of self-doubt about my writing skills. I'm not mm. as confident about that as I was when I was a teenager and I wrote Creed, it was literally stream of consciousness. And when you yeah. read it, you can tell it's like, oh, this, kid, this kid's just talking about whatever is on his mind that day, you yeah. know? Um, and now I feel all this pressure and I wonder, do you deal with a lot of, like, do you get creative paralysis? Do you deal with a lot of personal doubt about your story? Do you ever write out a whole scene, draw out a bunch of sketches for it or pages for it, and then go, no, that sucks, I'm changing that because now I'm locked into this story arc, but that's not the outcome that I want. Do you change your mind a lot? Do you go through self-doubt as a writer? I go through self-doubt all the time as a writer. And I think um, growing up, I never considered myself a writer. Mm-hmm. It was in my 30s, you know, when I realized I, I wanted to be an artist because I wanted to tell stories. But it, it's more like um, I, I, I realized that, you know, just as like I tell a story to you now, I can tell a story with art. Or, you know, a, a, a script writer gives me a script and I have to tell that story with art and with execution. So... Um, so I started throwing away these ideas in my mind 
um, that I can't write. Maybe I'm not a novel writer. Maybe I don't know grammar. Maybe I can't spell anything right. But I can tell a story. Mm-hmm. And I'm confident in that because I've had so much um, experience working with different people having me tell their stories. Mm-hmm. And um, but, but once I started putting a remind out there, it really started stressing me out because I was like, how is this going? Is this going to conclude in a way that the audience's general reaction is going to be positive? Yeah. Are they going to be satisfied? And I didn't know the answer to that because I'd never finished a, a big story that was the size of Remind, you know, 300 pages and, and took people on a year, two, three year journey, like watching me finish it. Like, is this going to pay off? So that was very stressful. Yeah. And, um, you know, people, the the thing is, people enjoyed the experience and they enjoyed the journey. And I think it's kind of like Miyazaki's stories, the way I look at his stories is like, he's just opening up a window in time in this other culture and just inviting you to watch it, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. And um, I like looking at stories that way, like, like, try to just open up a window of, into this parallel universe or whatever it is and just let people take it in we mm-hmm. don't have to explain everything right. and um and uh so so finishing remind was was kind of a confirmation there were some people who are like ah you don't know how to end, end stories you know a couple people were upset about it it was too rushed or whatever mm-hmm. and um and then sithra came around and and i had written this one out mostly you know was, a lot of it was bullet points but but um it, I was really doubting the ending of that one too because mm-hmm. I was like, well, there's so many weird concepts, some abstract things I'm trying to put on paper. How is this going to actually land once once we get to it? And, um, you know, by the time I – and I was, the train was moving on that one. You know, once I got that Webtoons deal, like I had – I, I couldn't slow down. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so I, it was like forcing me to just execute and trust the initial idea. Mm-hmm. And and I think that's been the, the the best thing for me is just trusting that initial spark, that initial exciting concept yeah. that that you had, because it's it was new to you at the time and it's going to be new to your audience when they see it, you know, um, as long as you execute it beautifully, uh, and and so so now I'm in this other world. Okay, so there was another transition pay, point when I took Phobos and I was trying to rewrite it. Mm-hmm. So. Phobos was like your creed, where it's like a stream of consciousness when I was a teenager. Mm-hmm. And now I'm trying to take those concepts and say, what what I, I wanna I want it to um to to celebrate that old work, but I I want it to also be written well or mm-hmm. better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so so what do I take out and what do I add? Mm-hmm. And that was a real mind game trying to figure that out. Um yeah. And then, and then now I'm on this stage where it's like I'm just writing a script now. What in the world am I doing writing a script for people? And I'm giving it to people that were like showrunners and people who were responsible for like the the guy who whose pet project it is is this guy named Rick Reckadall who is head of DreamWorks's franchise development for like 20 <laughs> years, and he's. He goes around and does speeches on storytelling. Uh, I, and I'm like, why is he trusting me to write yeah. his script for him? And I'm not a writer, yeah. right? I'm just not. And I got the notes back uh, last night. And there's like four people giving notes. And um, all day today, i am just been kind of like sweating. Palms are sweaty. And the notes aren't bad. It's just like put a comma here. And why, why did she say that? Mm-hmm. And I'm like... But I'm still stressing out because I'm not a writer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, but I but I can tell stories. Yeah. Right? right. And people people like the way I tell stories, and so I have to just trust that people do. People are not lying to me. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, they're not lying to me when they say, "Here's a project we want you to do," or "We liked your story," mm-hmm. um, or "We liked the way you told the sequence." Yeah. You know. Um, and. It's like it's just this mind game that you fight with yourself, and eventually, it's just like when I got into DreamWorks, I, I was wrestling with this, but with art, thinking I'm not good enough to be here. Uh-huh. But then I realized they hired me because I'm good enough to be here. Yeah. I need to just be confident and just trust that I'm good enough to be here. Let, let me just execute it the way I would. Mm-hmm. And when I would do that and get into that frame of mind, like I'll just do it the way I think I should do it. Yeah. Like people praise it, and those are the things that are like, wow. 
everyone loves it and like can you show this to, to all these other people now you know and um it's just it, it's like you just gotta trust in that trust in that initial spark trust in in all the 25 years that you've put into learning to tell stories and draw and execute and scene layouts and compositions you're trusting all that because you're you're you know that's yeah. That's your storytelling. Right. Well, I don't, I don't doubt, like, I imagine that after enough momentum, after you've done several books, it probably yeah. feels like drawing. It's like, I don't really second guess. I don't scrap a whole painting anymore. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I yeah. know that I can resolve the problems that are going to come up along the way. And it's not really something that I'm nervous or fearful of. But with writing, I think I'm I'm much earlier on, even though I've been writing comics for years, it's like I never read books like Story by Robert McKee or until oh, yeah, like the yeah. last couple of years, you know, like yeah. uh, I never really read things like Save the Cat or uh, yeah. any of these things about like how to improve uh, your structure. I would just start writing yeah. when I was younger. My, my, and, and that's how I was too. And um, I've read those books and... You know the the thing I can the only thing I can say is like it's good to know that stuff, but then you got to throw it out. You throw it out, yeah, yeah. That's you exactly know? where it's exactly where I'm at now. Where after a few years later of writing and rewriting things, I'm realizing yeah. that yeah, those are great rules and they're good yeah. to have in the back of your mind. Much like learning anatomy, it's like if you're always still in the state of or still still lifes, but you're painting still lifes. And it's like, yeah, I'm studying the materials and like how lighting is affecting that material and the, the color and, and the bounced light and all these things. If you're it, you, at some point you're, you're doing that subconsciously. Like yeah. he, there's, yeah. I think Bruce Lee tended to, he had like a, a, a flow state where he, he was training when he was training and that was mentally like focused and, and he would become exhausted. But then the moment that he was in, in the moment of an actual fight, it was fluid. It was trying, he was yeah. trying to reach a state of no mind where yeah. he could just react and the training would kick in automatically. But in the, in the, during the training, you're conscious aware of it, aware of it, consciously aware of it. When you're, yeah. when you're not, or when you're not training, you should be able to pull that up naturally. At, yeah. at least that's, I think, that's my, my theory on it anyway. Yeah. You got to do I, basically and, the more you do it, the better you get at it is basically exactly, it. Yeah. yeah. And this might get me some hate, but I, I really think a lot of those books are for people who can't trust their instincts. Mm. You know, um, you gotta you gotta just do stuff and trial and error until you get to where you can trust your instincts. And my my general rule of thumb now with all my it's been this way for a long time. And that very first director I worked with that became friends with, he told me this, or I don't know if he told me this or he said it once, and it's kind of stuck with me. And it's. And, I, and the statement is this: If it's if I'm getting bored while I'm writing this, then it's boring. Mm, if I'm yeah. bored while I'm watching this movie, then it's a boring movie. Yeah, you know. It's and so point. I I try to really I, I just try to always be excited about it. And if I if I'm not excited about it, then it's not going to be excited exciting for someone else. Right. And um, and really, it's like I didn't write Remind with any sort of hero's journey in mind at all i didn't even know about hero's journey when i wrote remind right. but then i went to a class once i got into dreamworks and they taught us about hero's journey and i i, I put remind down on paper and was like how does this fit and, and sure enough you know it, it it can loosely fit to the hero's journey yeah but it was all just because i wanted to make something that was like okay now now there's a threat yeah. you know now yeah. let's, let's you're just geeking out you're just geeking yeah. out on the thing that you like, love yeah yeah but star see, wars did this so and yeah i'm gonna do that you know and See, so, um, I actually found that working, uh, working in AAA games for me anyway, made me learn to doubt my instincts, my, hmm. uh, my, my sort of, like, like I said before, when I wrote Creed, when I was a kid, I didn't, I never had the self doubt. I mean, the first book, of course, you know, it's like, are going to, this is so weird. Are people going to we have purple colors all over the cover? It was like <laughs> so bizarre. And, uh, and that was all just inspired by uh, Disney animation. And it wasn't even about a comic book superhero, you know, so it was weird for the time. And, and I never doubted it though. I just write stream of consciousness stuff. This kind of a thing is going on in my life. This would be a cool conflict for the character. Ooh, I need a new villain. Oh, I did a sketch of a character. I think he'd be a cool villain. And you just yeah. work it in because you never 
question. It's like, I need a book in a month. I got to finish it. Yeah. But, but then I went to go work in, in games and like working on Diablo three, for instance. I mean, good God, we threw out hundreds of concepts, mm-hmm. you know, and it's yeah. like, no, no, we're looking for the, the best idea. And it's like, well, I could keep working this reworking the same painting for the next 30 years and it still wouldn't yeah. be the best painting it could be. So there, there developed this mindset of doubt and it festered and it festered mm-hmm. so much um, because I, I really like, I, I appreciate the friends that I made during that time and their respect matters to me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, the people who I've met in my life, it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to look at the work that I do with embarrassment when I'm showing it to people that I consider, you know, friends and peers and you know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so I, I, I tend to kind of, that's where that, that kind of doubt comes from where it's like, no, no, this isn't as good as this triple A thing. This isn't as good as it could be, mm-hmm. but, but mm-hmm. I have to learn to let go of that and remember that in the indie scene, you don't have time. Yeah. To like keep reworking. You you take you the feedback and you just save that for the next project. It's like, oh, so yeah. people didn't yeah. like these kind of endings from me or these kind of scenes from me. So uh, maybe I should yeah. eliminate those from my next project, so to speak, you know? Yeah. And I mean, just think about like uh, the 90s, like Todd McFarlane, Sam Keith and all those people going off and starting an image. Like they just made stuff. Yeah, they and if you stuff. a lot of times you read it and you're just like, this is terrible writing or whatever yeah. it is, yeah. you know, or this is strange, yeah. but um, they just made it, you know, yeah. they they put it out there and 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 sold it, and I think that was one of the things that really drove me nuts about working in animation is the amount of stuff that you would work on that would get thrown away. Yeah. I you know I designed so many sets and locations with intricate details that were just no, nope, well it it's men- it's just mentioned now in the movie, yeah. you know. It's hard and, to go um, back to. It's hard to go back and take another job doing that when you know mm-hmm. that it's very likely that this might not really equate to something yeah. in the game. It might the game yeah. might get canceled. No one will ever see this. Yeah, no one will unless ever it's in the it. art book. Yeah, exactly. That is a <laughs> yeah. brutal, brutal life to yeah. live, especially when I don't know about you, but I mean, you know, I'm. Uh, I've been around on this earth for a few years, and it's it's you don't get younger. Yeah. At yeah. some point, how many more years am I going to have my eyesight? How many more years am I going to be exactly. able to draw? You might be in a car yeah. accident. I don't want to get exactly. morbid, but like everything could be taken away from you tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And then will you look back and go, oh my God, I, I could have done that story that didn't yeah. get thrown away. Like I yeah. know people that worked on, uh, uh, there was a game called Titan that was a, it was a canceled project at Blizzard. I know people who worked on that for seven or eight years mm-hmm. and then they canceled mm-hmm. that whole project. Wow. And what do you have? Yeah. Like that, that can really That's crush rough. your spirit. And I, I mean, it can, it can take a little while to build up the ambition to want to do something again and feel mm-hmm. like, no, this time it's going to matter. Mm-hmm. That's a, almost yeah. a, a whole career for some people. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's why I'm so much more excited to just execute and just put it out there with my own stuff. So because, right. I, you know, kind of once I go through the thumbnailing stage, it's like I'll change some some th- scenes in that mode, um, but once I kind of lock it down, it's like 99% of that stuff stays, and it's just like I try to just trust that original instinct yeah. and and just run with it. And you know what? I can do it better next time. Right. You know, it's like yeah. you said. Yeah. I can do it. Take all the advice and put it into my next project. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Exactly. As long as you can keep. As long as you can keep doing it. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, and as long as you're keep keep producing stuff you're, you're always going to learn and grow and if it's your own thing you can release it even if it's something that yeah. you give away i mean that, exactly. that in yeah. some ways is almost more valuable like i wish that i could take all the the artwork that i i had done for projects that were canceled and just yeah. at least give it away so that people could see it because then yeah. at least it's something that sort of documents those years of my life that yeah. I, were very passionate years for my craft you know? yeah Hey, I saw your last video about um, just finishing projects this year. <laughs> That's my big and, project this year. It's like, yeah, it's I, and I saw on your Gumroad you have a thing that's like, uh, what is it? Uh, finish not perfect. I saw that yeah, you did yeah. a you did a, a project re- on that too. Is it re- is it like a video? It. Yeah, I re released that on YouTube. It's on YouTube for yeah. free now. It's called uh, it's called the Power of Personal Projects. Yeah, and it just goes through my life and and I show my personal projects and then what doors opened up from mm-hmm. that. Yeah. And so um, 
I just want to encourage you with your stuff. Like, I mean, yeah. all that stuff you can get done, it's mm-hmm. just it's going to just blow more people's minds, you know, open up so many more doors for you. You, would, you wouldn't believe all the canceled indie games that I started where I was learning yeah. to program uh, yeah. or the, the, the unfinished novels that I felt like just weren't good enough because they got feedback that like, hey, you need to rewrite this or, you know, and it's like, you know, the artwork was good. I, I spent three months on this yeah. thing. Why did I just yeah. throw it away? Yeah. Um, uh, it's so sad. Yeah. Yeah. It's sad. And and at least like now people can go and download them. I just, I just put some of those short stories up for free. And I was like, yeah. I was thinking about it. Oh, what was it? I was watching uh, a scanner darkly. Do you know what mm-hmm. that is? It's an mm-hmm. animated film, a rotoscope, yeah. some big actors in it. Keanu, uh, your buddy from the Matrix, <laughs> Keanu's in that. Uh, and uh, anyway, it was based on a story by Philip K. Dick. Uh, uh, I don't know if the short story was called that, but I was like, he didn't even finish any of his stories. Uh, Blade yeah. Runner was do androids dream of electric sheep. It was just a concept. It was that other yeah. world, and it was like, hey, that's neat. That's interesting. And the f- it's it's good enough that somebody looked at it and went that's that whole concept is interesting enough to base yeah. something bigger on and I'm like I'm the kind of a person that can't stick with one freaking idea for more than you know a year aside yeah. from Twilight Monk but that's like just because it's yeah. I'll always love kung fu <laughs> and dragons you know uh, yeah so I might as well just do all these short stories you know and and I've yeah. got notes and notes and notes and I might as well just do like maybe three or four illustrations do a short novel or a short story for yeah. this written out and then put it out as a little book that people can read. And it's in a little episode. It's a little fun adventure. Yeah. And, and screw it. If I, it's not good enough for some people and they say, Oh, I only read full length novels. Well, I'm sorry. That's not for you. It's like, yeah. well, you know what you're making, you're making a, a whole pile of pitches that yeah. all the studios and all the producers can just be scouring through all your little concepts. Sure. And I mean, you know, my thousand page sister book is one pitch. Right. The same as your, you know, one month project that you just put a couple sketches in. It's one yeah. pitch. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And exactly. so um, it's a really smart move to do that, I think. Well, thanks. I appreciate your support in that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So your, your journey had actually really been an inspiration for me uh, during a period of time when I left a lot of the AAA game development to do my own mm-hmm. thing a lot more. And uh, yeah. it's one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to have you come out on the show. Maybe we'll 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 do another uh, interview at some time in the future. But I think this has been super educational and very inspiring. I th- I think there are going to be a lot of people out there that are going to be listening to this conversation and realize, man, like there's this guy. He's been on quite an adventure, quite a journey. So uh, go definitely everybody go and check out uh, Jason Brubaker. What's the website that uh, people um, can? Follow you well, on? they can they can go to coffeetablecomics.com, and that's where my books are. Mm-hmm. And then they can search me on YouTube, Jason Brubaker, or Coffee Table Comics, and you'll find my YouTube. Um, I'll put and, some links. I'll put a couple of links yeah. in the uh, under the video, and they're all interconnected. One of the things that Jason's really good at is making <clears throat> sure that you can find him once you find one. Once you find one breadcrumb, there's a whole world that un- unravels, <laughs> and, and you can find yeah, yeah. go deeper down the rabbit's hole. So uh, I want to thank you so much for. I, I just uh, wanted to. Yeah. I just wanted to jump in and say one thing. Okay. So um, I think the la- I, I rediscovered your YouTube channel not too long ago, actually, believe it or not, mm-hmm. um, because when I was taking a break from Remind uh, after finishing Remind, I kind of unplugged from everything online. Mm-hmm. So I uh, I deleted all my blog, you know, that I blogs that I followed, and just kind of was like, I'm signing off. I'm not thinking about any of this. And so that's when I kind of lost touch with, with what you were doing. And, and so I think the last video I saw of yours on YouTube was one when you were drunk and you were talking about quitting everything and moving to an island and, and living with turtles or something. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I found yeah. your YouTube channel yeah. again, I was like, wow, Trent, it's just like, he's yeah. doing great now. This is awesome. <laughs> that was a joke video. I... I <laughs> It, but so it is true. I, I, uh, I went through a period of time where I, I, I did a lot more just kind of, I guess it was entertainment on my YouTube yeah. channel. And it was just me goofing off and doing stupid junk. Oh. And uh, but, I mean, it's it's changed. It's refined. I refined my, my craft so and my presentation. Refined, so, I got to give you props. Your refinement has been wonderful. 
Thanks. <laughs> well, you learn from doing, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. My first videos, I was so nervous that I, I would, I would drink a little bit of alcohol uh, for my videos <laughs> just to loosen up because I, I, I get nervous around cameras. Yeah. Now I think it's like, I don't know. I think I'm the same person all the time. So it's not, it's just like I'm hitting record and you know yeah. what I'm saying? It's just the same. I mean, I, you know, I, I watch the language a little bit because uh, yeah. in real life I talk like a sailor, but other than that, <laughs> pretty much the same. Yeah. Uh, but, well, very cool. Well, thanks for having me, Trent. This has yeah, been fun. Yeah. It's been really good catching up with you. And uh, of course, obviously I want to thank you for, for taking a minute to, to be on my YouTube channel and uh, we'll catch up with you on another video in the future, hopefully. Sounds great. I love it. All right. Dudes, lots of kick-ass info in there from Jason Brubaker. Thank you so much, Jason, for stopping by. Dudes, uh, if you're tuning in and like, yeah, if you'd like to see more interviews with other AAA game developers, indie comics guys and indie game developers, don't forget to subscribe. And dudes, I'll catch y'all manana bot. And ciao, baby. Oh, yeah. That's it. I'm moving to an island. <laughs> <laughs>